Hi, and welcome again to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. For the past few videos, we've been looking at absorption and emission, and the way that these are affected by the nature of the excited and ground electronic states. Today I want to tell you about one more interesting application of those phenomena, lasers. You might recall from video 31 that in many spectrometers we use a monochrometer and a slit in order to select a small range of wavelengths of light that emerge from the light source. However, for many experiments, we'd like to be able to hit the sample with just one wavelength of light instead of a range of wavelengths. How can we do that? Well, one solution would be to narrow the slit so that we can select a smaller and smaller wavelength range. But there are two problems with this idea. First, if we make the slit narrower, that means less light will get through overall. So unless we make the light source much more powerful, the intensity of light that hits the sample will decrease. That could make the light too faint for our detector, and could also prevent the sample from reacting with the light if there's a photochemical reaction we want to cause. And in any case, even if we narrow the slit, that still doesn't mean that only one wavelength would get through. We can't make the slit infinitely thin. If we have a very narrow slit, the spectrum of the light that gets through looks like this. There's a maximum at the center, but there's still significant intensity at wavelengths slightly higher and lower. The width of this spectrum at half the maximum height is called the bandwidth of the light. So what we'd like to do is make the bandwidth as narrow as possible while keeping the intensity high enough to cause a significant interaction with the sample. How can we do that? The solution is to use a laser as our light source instead of a light bulb or a gas discharge lamp. You're already familiar with how lasers look and behave, but today I want to talk about them in a little more detail. A laser has three characteristics that make it different from other kinds of light source. First, it's very tightly focused, or collimated. As we'll see soon, that's not just because there are lenses to focus the light. For example, suppose you had a polychromatic light source like a light bulb. We place a card with an extremely tiny pinhole next to the light source and look at the light that gets through the hole. What we'll find out is that the light coming through the pinhole doesn't stay focused for very long. It'll quickly spread out to the sides so that the light covers a larger and larger circular area. On the other hand, a laser stays collimated over a very, very long distance. That means that the light from a laser actually can't be seen from the sides. There's no light coming out of the light beam at an angle. But wait, you know that you can see laser light, like this beam coming from a laser that we can use for stargazing. How is it possible that we can see that light? The reason is because the laser light is being scattered by dust and other particles in the air, which cause some of the light to change direction and reach your eyes. If we were to shine this laser in a vacuum where there are no particles to scatter it, we couldn't see the light unless it was pointed directly into our eyes, and that would be very, very dangerous. The second characteristic of laser light is that it's very intense, much more intense than a polychromatic light source. For example, a 4-watt argon ion laser is more than intense enough to burn skin, even with only very brief exposure. Even a beam of only 0.1 watts is intense enough to cause permanent damage to your vision if it shines directly into your eye. Argon ion lasers are sometimes used in laser eye surgery, so they can be used safely by a trained physician, but accidental exposure can be very harmful. Finally, the third characteristic of laser light is that it's monochromatic. A laser can produce light of only a single wavelength, and that's something very desirable for many experiments in chemistry and physics. So, how do lasers work? To find out, let's recall this picture of an atom's electronic energy levels. At ordinary temperatures, most of the electrons are in their ground state, down here. In a laser, we use an electrical current to excite the atoms so that the electrons move to an excited state. But the important thing here is that the electrons always move to the same excited state. We do this until there are actually more electrons in the excited state than there are in the ground state. This is a very unusual situation that would almost never happen under naturally occurring circumstances. 
The situation in which most electrons are in an excited state is called a population inversion. As you know, electrons prefer to be in the ground state. So almost as soon as the electrons reach the excited state, they emit a photon in order to return to the ground state again. Even so, we don't lose the population inversion because the electric current is still operating, so electrons are excited to the upper state at the same rate that they fall back to the ground state. The important thing to remember here is that all the electrons end up in the same excited state. That means that when they emit a photon, it'll always be a photon of the same energy, and therefore the same wavelength. That's why laser light is monochromatic. So why is a laser so tightly focused? To find out, we need to understand a little about the way a laser is constructed. Suppose the atoms we're exciting in the laser are in the gas phase. This is a very common situation, and it's what we have in a laser pointer in which the gas is often a mixture of helium and neon. The gas is in a cylindrical tube, which I'll show lengthwise in this diagram. These atoms get excited by the electrical current I described earlier, and when the electrons return to the ground state, they emit a photon. These photons are emitted in random directions and most of the photons simply hit the sides of the tube where they're absorbed by the walls. This has the effect of causing the laser to become hot, so a very powerful laser usually needs a cooling system to keep the walls of the tube from becoming overheated. Anyway, although most of the photons hit the walls of the tube, there are a very small number that happen to be emitted parallel to the axis of the tube, so they strike the tube at one of the two ends. That's where things become interesting. At each end of the tube, there's a flat, highly reflective mirror. That means the photons traveling parallel to the tube will strike the end of the tube and be reflected back. Since they're moving parallel to the length of the tube, they travel all the way to the opposite end, then get reflected back again. In principle, that could go on indefinitely. Keep in mind that although only a tiny percentage of the photons will be emitted at just the right angle to be parallel to the tube, there are on the order of 10 to the 20th power atoms in the laser, each of which emits billions of photons per second, so there's a lot of light bouncing between the mirrors. Anyway, there are so many photons being reflected back and forth in the tube that they overlap. And as you know from your physics course, when waves overlap, that means they will interfere with each other. Think about what that means will happen. If the waves are out of phase with each other, they'll destructively interfere. That means the peaks and troughs of those waves will tend to cancel each other out, and the light of those photons will become less intense. This will happen even if the photons are only very slightly out of phase. However, there will be a small percentage of photons that are exactly in phase, and those waves will constructively interfere. Now, think about what happens when that occurs. Those waves will add together, and that means the resulting overall wave will have a much higher amplitude. So, the wave is amplified, which means it becomes more intense. Since many billions of photons are added together in this way, that explains why lasers produce such an intense beam of light. It actually also explains why laser light is so tightly focused. One of the two mirrors at either end of the laser tube will have a tiny area that's less reflective than the rest of the mirror, through which the light can escape. Although I've said that the light waves strike the mirrors at an angle of 90 degrees, it's actually very likely that the angle is slightly different than 90. Even if it's as close as 90.000000001 degrees, that's different enough that the light will hit the mirrors in a slightly different location every time they bounce back and forth. They'll eventually hit the mirror where it's a little less reflective, and that'll allow the light to be emitted. Now, recall our discussion of light from a polychromatic light source emerging from a pinhole. We saw that such light tends to spread out after leaving the pinhole, and the reason it does so is that that light from a normal light source has every possible phase. 
This causes destructive interference and also has the effect of causing the light waves to spread out. That doesn't happen if all the light waves have the same phase, and that's what we have with laser light. For that reason, the light from a laser doesn't spread out very much, especially if the light is in a vacuum where there are no particles to cause scattering. Well, that's enough new material for today. When we talk again, we'll start a completely new topic, all about crystals and their structures and shapes. It'll give us a chance to look at some especially beautiful examples of minerals and gemstones. I hope you'll join me for that. But until then, have a good week. <music>